Hi, my name's Steve and welcome to the Seaside Allotment Channel. Now, I've just passed 7,000 subscribers to this channel and it's an incredibly kind of humbling experience to realise that so many people are watching the channel and hopefully getting some benefit from it. And I've only been gardening for four years and so that makes it particularly kind of poignant for me that in that time, um, you know, I've managed to learn something that's pretty useful to other people. And I've got to thank everybody for watching. It's, uh, it's an incredible kind of little community that's grown up around the channel. And it's part of a much broader, amazing YouTube video community, which uh, I feel you know, quite honored to be part of. So anyway, to celebrate that kind of quotes achievement, um, I thought I'd do a frequently asked questions because there's a lots of new viewers to the channel that don't have all the backstory and all of that sort of thing. So I'll just start off very quickly just talking about me. So I retired about four, four maybe yeah, four years ago now um, and I was pretty ill when I retired um, and you know I was spent probably a quarter of my life hobbling around on crutches when I could cope with crutches. Um, and you know, a lot of brain fog, a lot of pain all the time, uh, arthritis in all my major joints. And yeah, I was pretty ill, so I retired. Um, and you know, I committed myself really to kind of the good life uh, in the hope that that would, you know, dramatically improve my symptoms. And it did, and I did a video about that, I'll link it in the description. Uh, but that's kind of how I got into the allotment. You know, the, what I wanted to do was I wanted to grow my own food, get lots of gentle exercise, relax, uh, have my hands in the soil, and you know, and it worked. So the allotment, yeah, I've got a lot to thank the allotment for. And uh, I started making these videos really as just a way to uh, create a diary of what I was up to. And I still use it like that. In fact, it's incredibly useful. Uh, that's why I do a monthly tour so I can look back and see you know what I was doing a month ago so anyway that's my backstory um, Debbie got my wife got an allotment the year later and and then Jenny uh, my middle daughter she got uh, an allotment uh, maybe a few months after that so um, yeah so that's our sort of family of allotments and you know my allotment is sort of dedicated to year-round growing kind of maximum productivity, it's quite hard work. Um, by comparison with Jenny's plot, for example, Jenny's disabled and so her plot was really focused on absolutely minimum work. Um, so it's really, you know, we try to, you know, do, do as minimum as possible of work on, that, on her plot. Um, and we've just sort of designed it for her uh, so that she can still work it with her partner, with her husband now actually, John. Uh, and a little boy, Robin. And uh, Debbie's plot is very much kind of ornamental kitchen garden, kind of a kind of a plot. We all do a back garden. Historically, we've not grown a huge amount in the back garden, but this year we're growing loads more. And I've just done a video about that. So anyway, that's all the backstory. So where are we? We're always being asked where we are. Uh, we are in England, in the northwest of England, between Blackpool and Preston, just below the Lake District. Uh, and just to the west of the Rivington Hills. And so it's a kind of really nice little microclimate we're in here, we're next to the on, the, on the sea. On the banks of the Ribble, so, so in the Ribble estuary, uh, just as it sort of transitions to the sea. So where we are in St. Anne's is generally thought of as the sea. Go a few more miles um, east and you get to Lytham, which is sort of on the estuary. So we're in Lytham St. Anne's, it's the name of the town, but we're with the part we're in is St. Anne's. Um, so what's our climate like? Well, it's quite interesting really. Um, we get, generally we get not that much rain in summer. Um, it doesn't get incredibly hot, although obviously with climate change it's getting hotter. Uh, in winter we generally get, we get a reasonable amount of rain but not nowhere near as much as other parts of the country but we're quite windy but we're also not that cold so you know cold night for us is minus five uh, centigrade uh, a, a, an unbelievably cold night which might happen every few years is perhaps minus eight centigrade um, obviously the wind chill makes it a lot worse than that sometimes but you know that's kind of you know normally 
we're min minus sort of two or minus three uh, on a frosty night, but we're not always frosty. So there's many days in winter when we don't have a frost. Um, almost everything defrosts by the end of the day, by the middle of the day, really. Uh, so that's kind of what the climate's like. It's, uh, it's, it's not bad, really. Um, sometimes I wish it got a little bit colder to kill off a few more of the pests. We've still got whitefly, for example. Um, slugs are still active. Uh, it's been a particularly mild year, this one. Our house is sort of half a mile from the sea. The allotment's maybe a mile from the sea. And you can see that really in the frosts because there was no frost this morning at home, but there was a frost this morning at the allotment. So that's kind of quite interesting. Um, so how many plots do we have? Well, I mentioned we've got three plots. Uh, the growing area com of those three pots combined is about 250 square meters. Um, and we manage those plots in a kind of integrated fashion. So I do all the planning for all three plots. I sow all the seeds for all three plots. Uh, Debbie and Jenny and I, we all do our own planting. Um, and we harvest for the whole family as one big harvest all the projects we do together so you know if we're mulching all the paths with wood chip for example we do that as a family if we're moving you know laying down um mushroom compost um you know an inch of compost across the plots then we do that as a family so i've always been asked how long does it take well my plot takes the longest it's probably about one and a half days of work maybe a little bit less than that a week a lot of that time is actually harvesting and when i'm harvesting that's when i'm also weeding um, and often on a harvest day that's when i'll also do a little bit of planting so yeah that's my plot it takes a lot because it's very intense uh, intensively planted and um, it, that's changing this year really because we're growing more uh, alliums and root vegetables and things like that, things that need less water and less attention on, on my plot than we have historically, We're moving a lot of the things that need a lot of attention in summer to the back garden. Debbie's plot takes about maybe, you know, between half and one day a week on average. And Jenny's plot takes about an, an hour to two hours, uh, something like that. Um, and really Jenny's plot is designed really around three big days of work so there's a kind of day just about now when we mulch the paths prune the trees fertilize the trees mulch the trees all that sort of thing so we, so that's a one day and then we've got another day in kind of april when we clear the plots um, again of all the winter veg and we put down the compost for the year um, and then another day in kind of late September, early October, when we clear the plots again of all the summer uh, crops like the beetroot and the uh, squashes and things like that. And we again, you know, we clear those and weed them. Uh, and then we replant uh, with the winter crops, the field beans, the broad beans and the garlic and things like that. So three big days, which we do as a family and have a picnic and all that sort of thing. Uh, we get all the friends around to help us if we can. Um, and then, as I said, just like, you know, one hour a week or something like that, just to uh, do a little bit of watering, uh, do a little bit of weeding if there was anything to do. And then most of the time is harvesting, basically. Um, so that's the three plots. So often been asked how much do we grow? Uh, so lots of different ways of looking at that. Um, first way is we, we do roughly calculate the harvest value that we take off. Um, and we do that by counting the number of harvest containers. We use a standard harvest container, it's two litres. Uh, we, um, a few year, couple of years ago, what we did was we actually weighed and calculated the amount that we were harvesting, and then we divided that total. We did it for about a month or two months, I can't, can't remember exactly now. But let's say we did it for two months. So we harvested for two months, we counted the number of containers, um, we divided the total harvest value by the number of containers and that gave us about £2.50 as an average and that's what we do now is we just count the containers and multiply by £2.50 and that we would price that for organic fruit and veg 
obviously if you're just buying your um, fruit and veg from Aldi say then it wouldn't be £2.50 per container um, but anyway it's organic veg so we price it as organic veg um, the total comes to about £10,000 uh, a year it was 9700 I think this year um, and so that's pretty good we also think of that as about 10,000 meals it's about right um, and so that's pretty good we as a family D Debbie Jenny um, uh, John Robin and I we eat about 60% about of that the extended family eats uh, a, a bit quite a bit more and then net friends and neighbors eat the rest and it's kind of essential to grow a surplus if, if you you know if you want to be confident that there's enough for for us um, we've got to have a surplus otherwise we'd always be running short uh, because we're always having crop failures so although we you know we're fairly successful we grow a lot of stuff um, you know we're always getting like a better golden purslane being infested by green fly and, and having to be ripped up or carrots like this year you know all splitting you know so one of the main carrot get beds all split um, and so we're, no, we're not suitable for storage um, you know there's always a failure all the time the constant failures but you know if you grow a little bit more than you need and I recommend maybe you know 20-30% more than you need um, then you'll always have enough and then just give the rest of it away. So let's go on. So are we really self-sufficient? I often say we're self-sufficient in veg and that's true, but only because we classify tomatoes and cucumbers and things like that um, as fruits, uh, peppers and, and the like. Obviously it's kind of impossible um, economically uh, to be uh, fully self-sufficient in all fruit and veg, unless you really deprive yourselves and we're not prepared to deprive ourselves. We want to eat better than it's possible to eat without an allotment, not worse than <laughs> it's, uh, it is to eat without an allotment. So we do, though, eat seasonally. We don't freeze a lot of stuff, we eat fresh. And a good example of that, for example, is say radish. So, you know, radish do really well for certain parts of the year. They're really great in spring, they're really great in autumn, they're not very good in summer, and we don't really have them in winter. So we eat cucumelons instead of radish in summer. They're the same sort of crunchy, kind of zesty sort of taste. Uh, and we eat uh, ochre in winter. And again, that's the same sort of you know, like a, a crunchy uh, lemony taste. Um, so they're, they're great substitute for the radish. Uh, and we do that with everything. Uh, so, you know, we don't have cauliflowers all the way through the year. We've got cauliflowers now. We'll have cauliflowers in spring and we'll have cauliflowers in autumn, but then we'll also have purple sprout and broccoli and calabrese and kale flowers and all sorts of different things. So we, you know, each season basically, we have kind of the optimum crop for that season uh, that's similar in nature. Um, and we kind of do that for everything, you know, different types of leaves all through the year, um, different types of cooking greens all through the year. For, so spinach is another great example. So right now we're eating spinach, but we're also eating um, field bean tops. Soon we'll, you know, we'll transition over to true spinach for pretty much everything uh, until you know, sort of mid to late spring. Then we'll go on to um, things like New Zealand spinach and tatsoi, uh, and then we'll be back on true spinach again. You know, so it's just a cycle like that every year. So I'm sitting in my polytunnel now. I've always been asked how big's the polytunnel. Well, we got it from First Tunnels. I did a video all about that. Uh, it's 20 by 12, 20 foot by 12 foot. It's amazing. Uh, I really do recommend you get the biggest one you can afford. It does take quite a bit of watering in summer, but we've learned our lessons on that. We put big, th we're thick mulches down now. And we don't kind of, last year I interplanted with all sorts of things that needed more water. Uh, than peppers and tomatoes and cucumbers do so now we kind of just this year we're just focusing on the things that really love the heat and don't need huge amounts of water um, just sort of focus on those things so that's going to be cucumbers peppers um, tomatoes and some summer squashes early summer squashes uh, early beans um, and that's pretty much it 
So the other thing, when people see what we grow in the polytunnel, they think you must heat it. Well, we don't heat it. Uh, the sun heats it. It's heating it quite nicely at the moment. And it's about uh, 9.30, I think, in the morning. Um, and yeah, we just leave everything um, to cope with whatever le the weather throws at it. But we will lay down, if it's going to get really cold, we will lay down a bit of fleece. Um, and that does the trick really. So the, the sun heats the soil in the daytime. We put the fleece on at say, you know, three o'clock in the afternoon, something like that, three or four o'clock, whenever we get around to it. Um, and that traps the heat uh, that's released by the ground at night and nothing freezes really very often. Um, but we only need to do that maybe 10 times a year, something like that. Uh, but it makes a little bit of a difference. It's worth doing just for those few days. Um, how much does it cost to run the allotments? Well, so for all three, we generally count on about 10% of harvest value. Um, so that's about a thousand pounds, about 300 pounds per plot. Um, and where does that money go? Well, it goes in allotment rent, uh, it goes in seeds, it goes into kind of all the structures, the polytunnel, the coal frames, the raised beds and things like that, and the replacement costs for those things. Uh, replacement for polythene, for the polytunnel and the coal frame tops and the hoop tunnels. Uh, nets and meshes and fleeces, um, compost and fertiliser, although we don't use a lot of fertiliser but we do use a little bit, uh, you know, blood fish and bone meal. Um, um, uh, come on, come on, <laughs> poultry manure, uh, seaweed meal, things like that. And yeah, so that's pretty much it. Uh, you know, if you add up everything that you spend, um, it does it does add up a little bit. But basically, it's you know, it's only ten percent of the old oh, water storage. You know, water storage containers, gutters, all those sorts of things. It does add up, um, but ten percent of value we think that's a pretty good deal and uh, we're you know we're certainly very happy about that we wanted the allotments to be a zero cost hobby they're definitely much more better than a zero cost hobby we save a fortune off our food bill so uh, yeah it's a very good investment so people look at what we harvest in a, a typical week and uh, we harvest on a sunday um, and you know it takes a few hours uh, to get everything cleaned and packed and all that sort of thing people say what do you do with all that veg how do you get through all that uh, well I've already mentioned the fact that we um, gift uh, some, some of it it's probably about 30% that we give to other people um, and the rest of it we eat and we eat a lot of fruit and veg so I'll just go give you my exact personal example so in summer I'll have a smoothie for breakfast I'll have a big salad for lunch uh, I'll have an evening meal with two thirds of the plate will be veggies. Uh, I will have a fruit salad for supper and I'll have fruit or mange two peas or something like that for snacks. Um, so yeah, that's quite a lot, about 10 to 12 servings of fruit and veg a day in the summer. And that goes down in the winter because I'm not burning as many calories to probably eight servings of fruit and veg. Uh, the snacks come from dehydrated fruit, for example, rather than fresh fruit. Um, and I probably skip the smoothie in the mornings in the winter. So that's kind of typical. Um, so yeah, we eat a lot and so it saves us a lot. And of course, that's partly, you know, I talked about challenging my uh, autoimmune disease. You know, I think part of that process is eating a lot of organic uh, fruit and veg. A very wide variety. We grow 100, 100, 219, 219 different things, um, and that includes all the perennials, of which we have a huge number of perennials. Um, so we don't sow as many seeds as that, but uh, yeah, a huge variety of food. And in any particular month, we're probably eating 30 different types of uh, fruit and veg. So lots of people see my database that I use to manage the allotments and manage all my sowings and keep track of all my varieties and manage all my seed packets and all that sort of thing. 
Well, I'm doing a, there's a separate video of all about that. Um, but basically, you know, look, check out the description of my videos. All my videos have a description uh, and there's links there to things that I mention. Um, and one of the things that I mentioned is this database. Well, look in the description for the links and you, can, you can't you can download it um, because it's all cloud-based, uh, but you can take a, your own private copy of it in the cloud um, and you can play around with it to your heart's content. You can modify it, delete it, you know, delete my data from it, whatever you want to do. But you can also export a copy of it to a spreadsheet and so, if you prefer using a spreadsheet then you can get for example a copy of all my data with all the varieties and all my sewing dates and all that sort of thing so that's worth doing um, so lots of people ask me you know i'll mention a variety grenoble red and they don't catch it because i'm talk too quickly or they don't understand my accent or something like that well whenever i get round to it and I'm, i make a lot of videos and so it takes a long time to edit them and put descriptions in or overlays on the video for every single thing i mention every single week um, so sometimes i don't manage to do all that if you do really want to get the name of variety then check out my monthly sewing guides and all the things that i mentioned are all listed in documentary form there but also in all those sewing guides, there's a link to, and I'll probably put it in the standard part of my description as well. There's a link to every variety that we grow. Um, and you can link to my database and you can scroll through there and you can find every variety. Um, so, you know, that's, and if, as a last resort, you can ask a question as well. And I'm happy to answer any questions. So if you can't find it, uh, just ask the question. I'll answer that as well. Um, so lots of people say, what should I sew when? Now this is a tricky question because everybody's climate is different and every kind of location uh, has kind of got its own like, little microclimate. And of course we grow a lot of stuff under cover as well. Um, but what I have got are a number of tools to sort of help you uh, with that which I create for my own benefit, but I'm happy to share and happy to answer questions on. So the simplest of those tools is a sewing guide. Uh, that's just a document. It's about seven pages long, I think. It's got some nice pictures in it. Um, and that goes through each month and just says, you know, what to sew that month. Uh, and it has the optimum sewing dates for me uh, and it also includes a kind of logic as to why to sew certain things at certain times and what to replace those things with. So like the radishes and the s uh, spinach examples, for example. You know, I don't recommend ra growing radishes and spinach in midsummer, uh, but I do say what to grow instead of those. So hopefully that's useful and I'd love to set questions uh, on that document so I can improve it for my own purposes and for yours. So that's the, that's the simplest thing that I've got. The next thing is every month um, I do a what's, what I'm sewing and what I'm growing video. And that covers the progress of the things that I sewed last month and what I'm planning to sew this month. Um, and yeah, so that's a nice little video to sort of follow along on every month. Um, and there's loads of information in the description of that video. And then every week I have my allotment diary, links to that in the description of this video. And that is really useful for me. I keep track there of everything we harvested, everything that we've sowed, everything that we potted on, any first harvests of the month. So for example, this month, January, we did our first harvest uh, yesterday of cauliflower. Um, and the week before that was a first Savoy cabbage, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I keep track of what we've got in store and all of that. So that's a pretty useful thing every week. And you can subscribe to that as an email or visit it as a web page. Um, so that's useful. And what else have I got? And then, you know, I've got my actual databases that you can browse um, as well. Um, so yeah, quite a range of different tools and of course you can take copies of those own databases and make them your own and I highly re recommend that you do that rather than just use my database, customise it 
if you want. Uh, the only benefit of leaving it as I've designed it is that every year I do a new update of it that's a little bit better hopefully and a little bit simpler and if you just want to take my updates then you know you can do that as well. Okay we're nearly there so uh, do we make all of our own compost? No uh, we can't uh, make all of our own compost we don't have enough capacity and w because we can't get it quite hot enough uh, all year round. Sometimes we get really hot compost and that's great but you know frequently we can't get it hot enough and so there's lots of weed seeds in it um, and so we tend to try and use our own compost at the bottom of containers so the sort of bottom two-thirds of a container uh, or when we're making new beds again the bottom of those beds bottom half of those beds uh, or when we're putting on a thick mulch we'll put our own compost down and then we'll mulch on top of it uh, so that's kind of how we try to use our own compost um, and where so we buy our compost uh, the, the extra that we need we almost always get it from KC compost who's a local supplier I'll put link in the description uh, where do we get our nets from there's a link in the description but we sometimes just get like fleece and stuff from Amazon uh, I'll put links into those as well um, where do we get our seeds from well, I tend to buy just like seeds that are just universally available, say things like little gem lettuce and things like that. Well, I'll just get those from Amazon. I don't really care what variety I get. Um, but a lot of those sort of standard seeds like cabbages and lettuces and onions and things like that, we just get from uh, the magazine Grow Your Own or Kitchen Garden magazine, depending on which one we get. Um, and they have just an amazing uh, selection of free seeds. And it's a great way to get just a lot of the staples for very low cost. Um, for things that we grow huge amounts of, so things like beetroot, uh, onions, things like that, beans and things, field beans and stuff, we try and get those from moles seeds, uh, that's a commercial seed supplier, but we get big packets of those, carrots and things, um, and then we share the surplus of those with our friends, um, and for sort of specialist things, things that are quite hard to get hold of, like dazzling blue kale for example, uh, we get those from real seeds and everything else again which is sort of generically get from Amazon we don't we're not that obsessed with specific varieties um, we haven't been gardening long enough to get true favorites for everything um, we have a few a lot of the lettuces Grenoble Red Navarra things like that um, and they get, some of those come from specific seed suppliers um, like Johnson's for Colette's and uh, seeds of Italy for Grenoble Red, uh, King Seeds for Navarra, sort of thing, you know. So, you know, but Amazon sort of keeps track of, of all of that. We just search on Amazon for what we bought last year and just, you know, click buy again. It's just pretty simple. And I think that's it. That's quite a long um, frequently asked questions video, but those are the frequently asked questions. So, just if you've stuck with me all the way through this, Thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate it on this uh, 7,000 subscriber day. And I'll see you soon.